Welcome to LSEIQ, a podcast from the London School of Economics and Political Science. This is the podcast where we ask leading social scientists and other experts to answer an intelligent question about economics, politics or society. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and other social media platforms are irresistible to many of us, but there is growing concern that tech companies are putting profit before the well-being of users. The lack of controls over abusive and extremist content and the manipulation of opinion during the US election have all been in the news recently. In this episode, Joe Bale asks, is social media good for society? Felix Alexander was a promising 17-year-old sixth form student when, last year, he threw himself under a train near his hometown of Worcester after years of online bullying. It began when Felix was just 10 and classmates at his fee-paying school teased him because he was not allowed to play the video game Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, which has an 18 certificate. It spiralled from there and, with the advent of social media, moved online. His mother, Lucy Alexander, tried to get him to stop using social media as it was causing him so much distress, but that just isolated him further. He also moved schools, but the online bullying continued with tragic consequences. In an open letter published in the local newspaper after his death, Mrs Alexander appealed for more kindness on social media. Here's an excerpt from the letter in which she describes how worthless her son was made to feel. His confidence and self-esteem had been eroded over a long period of time by the bullying behaviour he experienced in secondary education. It began with unkindness and social isolation. And over the years, with the advent of social media, it became cruel and overwhelming. People who had never even met Felix were abusing him over social media, and he found that he was unable to make and even keep friends, as it was difficult to befriend the most hated boy in the school. In her letter, Mrs Alexander emphasised the need for a greater sense of collective responsibility on social media to prevent other lives being lost. Be that one person prepared to stand up to unkindness. You will never regret being a good friend. I have been told that everyone says things they don't mean on social media. Unkindness is dismissed as banter. And because they can't see the effect of their words, they don't believe there is one. Online abuse isn't just confined to children and teenagers. Many adults, particularly those in the public eye, are targeted by trolls and bullies on social media. Sonia Livingston OBE, is Professor of Social Psychology in LSE's Department of Media and Communications. She is a government advisor on internet safety and compares the digital world to William Golding's Nobel Prize winning novel, Lord of the Flies. I think none of us saw coming the kind of outpouring of hostility or um, transgression or bullying kinds of behaviour that were unleashed by a largely anonymous and kind of quite um, distanced uh, space. I mean, by distance, I mean, you can't see who you're communicating with and you don't see the consequences of what you're saying. Um, We kind of should have known that give people a free-for-all space. It's a little Lord of the Flies, I sometimes think. Um, But we didn't see it coming and, yeah. So, so there are some kind of shocking things going on. From young people's point of view, I think it's more that it's a very difficult space to understand the parameters and to understand what the kind of possibilities, where the possibilities and problems are going to come from, and really hard to put things right when something has gone wrong. And things can go wrong much faster in a social media environment than they can in a face-to-face environment. So why aren't people doing more to combat online bullies? Ellen Helsper, Associate Professor at LSE's Media and Communication Department, is an expert on online interactions. She is currently an advisor for a new West End play on cyberbullying, due to be performed later this year. The play is called Cyber Scene and has been endorsed by Dame Judi Dench as a way of addressing the issues associated with cyberbullying. Dr. Helsper worked with the director, writer and producer to create fresh material for the script by setting up workshops for young people to improvise social media scenarios. We played out certain scenarios where a young person was bullied and by somebody else 
And then we said, okay, what would you do to stop this from happening? At what point do you intervene? And then in the play, and when we first did these scenes, they were, oh, you know, somebody would go up and say, oh, stop, that's not on, that's not cool. And as the leaders of these workshops, we would say, okay, but is this realistic? Has this actually ever happened? So let's play it as if it's a realistic situation. Let's play it as if the person who is doing the bullying is, first of all, not on their own, but in a group of maybe two or three, is the most popular person of the class who will be organizing a big party that everybody wants to go to at the end of the week, right? Who's everybody's kind of popularity or confidence kind of depends on being recognized by this person as somebody that matters. And then you could almost feel that their awareness of this changed and that they understood how difficult it was. And that for me was a really interesting switch. And it's interesting when you see these young people play this out in the workshops that are then leading up to the production of the theater play, that there's a small, slow change in awareness that this is not something that is just done by evil people. Sometimes we do it without even realizing. And that also it's something that is part of our everyday life, that is kind of part of this without us even realizing um, that we are also, in a way, by being bystanders even, by not interfering or not recognizing that this is maybe a negative aspect of that online sphere, that we are just as much part of creating a world in which this is possible. The play will be performed at the Theatre Royal Haymarket and filmed for streaming during Anti-Bullying Week in November. Dr. Helsper explained how her research has helped in understanding the unique difficulties for young people who are faced with cyberbullying. It's not like we, there was never bullying before. It's not like all of a sudden this is a thing now that we have social media or digital media, but it's the pervasiveness of it. It's the 24 seven thing. There are certain patterns in this, in the kind of strategies that these young people use and uh, who they blame when something goes wrong. And what we call less productive strategies in this case are either the ostrich strategy or the toughen up strategy, um, which tends to be a little bit more prevalent in the young male participants in our research and in the project that you uh, talked about, which is, well, that's the online world. You just have to get a thick skin, get on with it, ignore it, just, you know, don't do anything about it, don't show that you're affected by it, and they will stop. Which is one thing that we know doesn't hap actually happen, so it's not a very good strategy, <laughs> just ignoring it. Um, that's one side of it. And then the other side is a total disconnect. And we see that a little bit more um, amongst young women, where they say, I can't deal with it, I don't know how to deal with it, I'm just going to go off social media. That's also not a good strategy because we've been talking a little bit more about the negative aspects, which is logical because we were talking about cyberbullying. But these social media are also really important for our well-being. It's where people make connections, where they meet friends, where they find out about exciting things that are happening, where you share, where a lot of the relationships and uh, friendships that we have offline are kind of supplemented or built on. Dr. Helsper believes that social media is developing social norms that tolerate online abuse, which need to be challenged by all of us. Bullying is almost never one-on-one. -on -one. It's almost always a group against an individual. And those groups can be very physical groups in the sense of groups in schools where it's a bunch of friends teaming up or forming a group against another person with a leader in that group, steering them on. Or it could be an anonymous uh, group, like we see this a lot in relation to more of the sex sexism or the sexual harassment online of women who tend to be much more likely to be victims of these kinds of things, where there's a kind of an implicit acceptance that this is the kind of thing that happens on Twitter, for example, or these kinds of things where there's anonymous people targeting a specific individual, in this case a, a woman, a young woman, or an older woman, and where because there's so many voices that are heard doing that and relatively little pushback in that actual space at that moment, that that anonymity and that 24 seven aspect of digital media can have this aspect. If there wasn't the social and the norms that get developed within these spaces, within specific groups, 
without that social aspect, anonymity in the 24 seven wouldn't do that much. So it's important that it's understood that there's these social norms and these social groups that are developing around these interactions as well as the fact that it's really hard to escape. I asked Sonia Livingston if social media could be blamed for rising mental health problems among young people. It's definitely more complicated. I mean, the social scientist uh, always wants to identify all the different factors that account for any kind of particular problem in society. So I think it is becoming clear that mental health problems among young people are on the increase over, let's say, the past decade. And of course, that period coincides with the rise of social media. But it coincides with a lot of other things as well, increased pressure on schools for and children for their exam performance, um, a lot of cuts in mental health services and in kind of youth and support services, um, a general societal uncertainty about how young people can go into confident employment and so on. So there's lots of reasons why we could say mental health problems are increasing. I think the social media are part of that and when I interview young people and others research young people, young people themselves will say they feel the pressures to look perfect, to be perfect, to portray a happy life um, and that kind of compounds the sense of exam pressures and pressures about the future. What do you think are the, the main problems at the moment then that need focusing on? Well, one really key problem that it makes this field both exciting and um, challenging is that it is just changing very fast. So we can say social media as if we know what it means, but uh, young people are using dozens of different social media platforms and they, being young people, what our research shows is they look for the edgier platforms, they look for the ones that are a bit under the radar of adults and where they can take some of the risks and transgress in ways that young people want to um, very often. But that means that they're often having their conversations in places that are not regulated. And we're used to, I guess, in our society, having a kind of sensible oversight of how young people spend their time and what happens to their communication. And suddenly, they're doing their various experimental conversations on services which keep a record of everything, which can um, commercialise those conversations, which can share them in ways that young people don't understand. And a lot of that conversation turns out, um, in reasons that seem to have taken our society by surprise, turns out to have been um, often hostile and harassing and coercive. And that's being recorded too. So there's a kind of you know, young people have always been transgressive in various ways and they've always been experimental, but suddenly it's all now being kept and potentially or actually used against them. Continuous surveillance by the companies that provide us with social media platforms is something that most of us don't really understand. I asked Nick Caudry, Professor of Media Communications and Social Theory at LSE, why he thinks we should all be a bit more savvy about the big brother aspects of social media. Nick, you're concerned about uh, the amount of surveillance there is on, on social media and how companies are using the personal details we reveal in social media uh, to promote their products uh, and that kind of thing. But is this not a small price to pay for something that we use for free and something that enriches our lives so much? Well, certainly that's what we're told. But I think we have to step back and look at the bigger model, if you like, the business model on which our whole uh, arrangement with social media is based. Uh, it's a very new point in history when um, business models, if you like the economic viability of social media, the social media infrastructures we rely upon, now depends on something that previously was regarded as taboo, as absolutely not positive, that is continuous automated surveillance. Why do you think people are a little bit perhaps relaxed about this at the moment, that they're not really quite uh, angry about it or protesting about it? What, what's, what's going on? Well, I'm not sure it's true to say people are relaxed. That certainly there are no protests on the streets about this issue, although there was a lot of unsettlement when the state uh, clearly was accessing some of the metadata 
which is of course what drives us rather than direct personal data, it's the metadata, the facts about who we speak to here and when. When that was revealed to be in the hands of the state at its command in the Snowden revelations, people were concerned, there's no doubt about that. And it's also true that novels that have tried to foreground this issue around the corrosive influence of constant surveillance on the quality of our lives, such as Dave Egger's novel, The Circle, which was published in America in late 2013, a few months after the Snowden revelations. That impact has had a huge, uh, uh, that novel has had a huge impact and it's now coming out in a film. So there is a slow burning concern here. The Circle is an eerily prescient tech thriller which tells the story of an internet company that encourages people to wear a portable camera which streams live personal footage from those who wear it, while another bit of technology tracks individuals' history and activities and directly impacts their professional career. Egger's novel has been praised for the accuracy with which it predicted technology trends such as social media and live streaming. The movie starring Emma Watson and Tom Hanks has recently been released. Why hasn't that converted immediately into a political issue? Well, there are a number of reasons. One, as I've already said, um, we think this is being done not by people, but by machines, by algorithms. And of course, that's true. There's too much data for human beings to sift it all in the first instance. But that doesn't mean to say that it's not being recorded, registered, can't be used at some point against us. Um, so that's one reason perhaps we're not immediately uh, on the face of it, uh, worried by it. And secondly, there, as you say, there's this pact of convenience. We certainly want to be connected to each other. We want that infrastructure that makes it possible to, for us to be in simultaneous chats with our family wherever they are around the world. But we do care about whether that data is encrypted. After all, that's one of the selling points of WhatsApp. Um, why exactly it was bought by its current corporate owner for so many billions of dollars still remains a mystery if the data can't be used, but we'll, we'll gradually find out and there's some um, disputes going on with the European courts, or at least the European regulators at the moment, about what exactly WhatsApp is doing with its data. Um, so I think there's a slow burning issue. And the third reason why it's slow burning is that it is so fundamental. We're talking about what I call a political fix, if you like, or even more a social fix that builds in, hardwires in surveillance to the basic running and building of our social world. We've never confronted anything like that before. Surveillance used to be a matter of the whim of the king or the crazy operations of an overstretched state in the Soviet parody or the East German parody. We've not dealt with something that's built into the very nature of how a basic good is delivered to us. And that's a fundamentally new thing for all of us to get our head around. And it's not surprising it's taking us quite some time to do so, particularly, and this is the fourth point, particularly when corporations do not want us to be discussing this. This is exactly the difficult area, the nerve point within the whole shift of business online that is very important to move past to emphasize other more positive benefits. Do you think people are being duped then in a way because um, big business is not really coming clean on, on this kind of surveillance that they're doing? Well, duped is a harsh word and I certainly don't think there's a corporate conspiracy here. Because as I said, because the fix is at such a deep level, it's the fix that enables it, enables corporations of all sorts to imagine the generation of value for the next century. <laughs> They're just trying to do what they need to do, which is to generate value. So there's no conspiracy, there's no evil plotting here. However, there are consequences of the decisions being made now, which it's very inconvenient to emphasize. It's very inconvenient to have open debate about because they do challenge the whole direction of travel in businesses across really all sectors. As the great uh, a very critical technology expert in the States, Bruce Schneier puts it, the business model of the internet is mass surveillance. Now, is that something that's being emphasized to us in every marketing campaign today? I don't think so. And it's pretty obvious why it's not a very comfortable message. As well as mass surveillance, there is growing evidence that social media is also manipulating our opinions and poisoning democracy. 
Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg and its CEO Sheryl Sandberg initially rejected suggestions that fake news traveling on the network could have swung the US election in favor of Donald Trump. But then Facebook announced it would begin flagging fake news stories and publicly acknowledged that its platform had been exploited by the Russian government in seeking to manipulate public opinion in other countries, including during the presidential elections in the US and France. 62% of US citizens now get their news from social media, which has led to traditional news organisations losing millions in ad revenue. So there are worries that journalists just don't have the resources to hold the rich and powerful to account anymore. LSE's Svenja Otto Vorden Genschenfelder is an expert on how political journalism is adapting to social media. She believes that there is reason to be more optimistic. Change and technological innovation has always been a part of journalism. So if you think about, um, you know, I guess the big move from analog to digital, when television first entered the market, then the internet, now, you know, mobile devices, everyone has news literally at their fingertips. Um, all of these um, changes might seem um, very big and daunting and transformative, and they certainly are, but if we look at it you know, with a, I guess, more historic perspective, we can see that technological change has always been um, a big player in sort of the development of journalism. Um, but I think we can also say that arguably these are very troubling times. So if we look, you know, at um, uh, Donald Trump as the president in the United States and the very contentious debates that happen around that, both within the country, but also um, with regards to what white politics, um, just as much as you know, Brexit in the UK, um, I think it is a time where despite the many concerns over journalism survival and its role in society, in a way journalists are called upon to sort of be that you know, somewhat idealistic or normative watchdog that holds elites to account and provides the context and analysis that we desperately need to kind of navigate the many troubling things I think that we're witnessing currently. But do you think, I mean, that if journalism is in crisis and they're also meant to be the watchdogs, I mean, surely that means that there's going to be a problem at some point? Yeah, but I think it's also these very extraordinary circumstances that usually open up opportunities that we didn't see were there before. So I think it is that moment in time when, when um, you can kind of move into a space and find a new way um, to, to offer something or provide analysis or news reporting that wasn't there before. So if I think of um, David Farentold, the Washington Post reporter who was just awarded the Pulitzer Prize two days ago, which is actually a great example for this. So um, he won the Pulitzer Prize for um, his national reporting on uh, Donald Trump's charitable giving. So the president of the United States has made claims over the past couple of years of donations he's made out, out of his personal money uh, to a range of charities, um, but you know there, there wasn't ever any substantiated sort of evidence um, that could back this up. So David Farentold set out to investigate how much he had actually donated. Um, and he made a handwritten list of over 400 organizations um, and uh, couldn't really dig up much evidence. And at some point he decided to start sharing photos of his list on Twitter. Um, and then while well, he did that, and that was a very transparent way of sharing his reporting as it was still ongoing. So the investigation was still in full swing. And um, what happened is that a lot of people respond very positively to him sharing his reporting on Twitter. Um, but not only that, people started chipping into the investigation. So people who had you know, specialist knowledge of a charity that you know, maybe was, or, uh, was um, operating close by to where they lived or um, people started suggesting um, new organizations or charities to be investigated. Um, they made a major contribution in a way to that ongoing investigation. Um, so, so I think um, David Farntold's um, investigative piece showcases the, the new ways of how journalism can be done, capitalizing on many of these affordances that new technologies and platforms like Twitter offer, while not really giving up on your traditional values and standards of production. And I think the fact that he has won the Pulitzer Prize for this particular piece of investigation certainly gives testimony to this. Nick Coldry is also optimistic that society will continue to benefit from social media as long as we learn to pay more attention to potential costs. So there's no doubt 
that in the past five to 10 years, we've become used to a massive expansion of, if you like, the space of the social. The social space, the space, the texture that connects each of us to each other in a world that we recognize as a world we live in together. That has changed fundamentally. It has a different depth. It has a different degree of interconnectedness. If you like, it's woven in a diff out of a different cloth than before. And much of that can, of course, be potentially positive. It enables political mobilization at much greater speed, whatever the outcomes, good or bad. Um, it enables us to follow each other across the planet, to point at things that will excite us, and someone at the, the other side of the planet can see it within seconds. An astonishing thought that we could ever do such a thing, unimaginable, except to our, uh, those living in the, in the 21st century. It is the fact of our existence, but we have to pay attention to the potential costs as well as the joys, the benefits, the excitements. For Lucy Alexander, the cost was the devastating loss of her youngest son with his gleaming smile and mop of dark curly hair. Children are witnessing a warped form of reality as violence and pornography are being normalised by their ease of access. We have a collective responsibility to prevent other young lives being lost to unkindness and bullying. You may see that I have repeatedly used one word in this letter, and I make no apology for this. The word is kindness. I said this at our son's funeral. Please be kind always, for you never know what is in someone's heart or mind. Our lives have been irrevocably damaged by the loss of our wonderful son. Please don't let it happen to any other family. Our experts agree that social media has brought huge benefits but that we have to be aware of the costs and make efforts to create a more civilised digital world that does not abuse or exploit us. Tell us what you think using the hashtag LSEIQ. This episode of LSEIQ was produced by Joe Bale, Tom Williams and James Ritty. The letter was read by Amanda Saunders. It was based in part on the following research. The Mediated Construction of Reality by Nick Coldry and Andreas Hepp. The Class, Living and Learning in the Digital Age by Sonia Livingston and Julian Sefton Green. Children, Risk and Safety Online, Research and Policy Challenges in Comparative Perspective by Sonia Livingston, Leslie Haddon and Anke Gordzig. A Social Digital Ecology Approach to Understanding Digital Inequalities Among Young People by Ellen Helsper. And Every Tweet Has Its Story, Influences Practices and Perceived Outcomes of Political Journalists' Twitter Engagement by Svenja Otto Vorden Genschenfelder. If you've been affected by cyberbullying, help and advice is available at Bullying UK at www.bullying.co.uk or place to be at www.placetobe.org.uk. For more episodes of this podcast, all the associated links, and to subscribe on iTunes and SoundCloud, please visit lse.ac.uk forward slash IQ. In the next episode, in the light of the UK's vote to leave the European Union, we ask, what does Brexit tell us about the white working class?